Thank you very much. Be before we start, and, and we start to look at the material, and, and we've, we've got some great stuff today, I'd like to ask you to help me out with what is one of the most important parts of today's presentation. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Don't worry, it's not very difficult. Uh, and, uh, and then the rest of the time, I do the work. So if you would, please stand up. Put your hand on your heart. It's on this side. <laughs> Turn to face the back of the room. Now, very carefully, because of the, the uh, furniture, take one step forward. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Please sit down again. Please sit down. That's wonderful. Thank you. I said that was the most important part of the presentation, not for you. That's the most important part of the presentation for me. Um, I work for this gentleman here, a gentleman called Bud Haney. He's the founder of our company. And he has what he likes to call a hands-on approach to the business. We like to say he tends to interfere in everything. And sometime in the next week or 10 days, Bud will call Zvezdana and he'll say, tell me Zvezdana, um, what did Derek do for your audience in Slovenia? Now I like this job. I get paid for doing this job. And I get paid very well just for doing what I like, which is talking. That's what Irish people like to do. So I want to protect that. So now she can say in all honesty, oh, bud, he got them on their feet. He touched their hearts. He turned them around and he got them moving forward. So for three months job security, I'm now in your debt. Now I owe you and I need to give you uh, uh, some good information this morning. Um, the rest of the work is mine from this point forward. In Slovenia, as elsewhere, and coming from Ireland, I can appreciate exactly the challenge that every leader in every economy uh, has today. Very simple. If in this room you have leader or manager or group lead or anything like that in your title, this is the only thing that matters. In the last two years, particularly, I guess, we've all been under pressure to make sure that the bottom line stays respectable. And so when, when things got started to get even tighter, we cut down the costs as, as much as we can. That's, that's what you do. And, and in fact, if bad times teach us anything, they teach us that in good times we get lazy. And sometimes we have costs there that we didn't really need. But I would say it's safe to say at this stage that we have trimmed down our costs pretty much in every organization everywhere as low as they can go. We re-engineered our processes. We looked at any way that we could do business that would make things more effective, more efficient, more productive. Well, we did that too. And now we're at the stage in 2011 where the Bud Haney's of your world, where the shareholders or the company owners or whomever you report to says, hey, you did a great job, but I need another 20% this year. I need another 25% this year. January 1 is always the time when you both celebrate and commiserate because in my company they say, hey, great job, Derek, you're up 35%, we need 45% this year. And that's the same in all our organizations. Reality. Over the next while, <clears throat> the only way that we can actually achieve that additional productivity, running the very lean operations that we have now, is if we can make each and every one of our people more productive. If we can get more from each and every one of our people. Now, the extent to which we can do that is really the extent to which they want to give us that extra productivity. It's the extent to which they are engaged. Engaged is, hey, I really want to do this job to the best of my ability. I am so interested in this organization and what I do and what we're trying to achieve that I'm even going to give you some of my time to get this thing done. And in just about every country worldwide, we have about 20% of people 
who are engaged. 20% of people who are positively disengaged. That is, if I can break this company, I will. And then the floating 60% in the middle who are, yeah, well, on a good day, I'm engaged. And on a bad day, I'm disengaged. And mm, I, I'll give you an average uh, return. Why is it important? Well, because basically there is an enormous difference between the results that engaged or organizations with high engagement get. In this, this one study by uh, Taras Perrin, you can see one of the larger ones, about 80,000, was it 80,000? 90,000 people, 18 countries worldwide. And they found very simply, high engagement companies dramatically outperform low engagement companies. And that makes sense. If the people that are working for you are genuinely dedicated to getting the results you want to get, of course you're going to get 51% greater uh, operating income than the average. And of course you're going to get a greater earnings per share. So in 2011, in 2012, in 2013, Engagement is going to be really one of those, those uh, issues that is going to become the primary concern of anybody who is a manager or a leader. Currently, of course, we're tied up in, in dreadful economic challenges. But hidden in behind those economic challenges uh, is an issue that hasn't gone away. And that is the demographic issue. The fact that in 10 years' time, employees will be more sought after than customers are. And so engaging the people we have, one, so they get the results we need today, and two, so that when things start to look better, they stay around. That's what it's all about, being a leader today. Now, critically, it's critically important that we know what engages people? There's a lot of talk in most of your organizations. You will have at least flirted with engagement. There's, there's been some talk about it and how you engage people and how you get them involved in their jobs and how you get them want to contribute more. And in my experience, a lot of the efforts on that side are focused in the wrong direction. Fundamentally, two things drive engagement. One is the extent to which you have the right person in the, job, the right job. Hey, bottom line, you put somebody into a job that they either cannot do, or where they're working in an environment that they just don't feel comfortable in, or doing work, God help us, that they don't want to do, and it doesn't matter what you do after that, they will not be engaged. They can't be. One of the founders of Profiles International, a gentleman called Jim Serbascu, really charismatic individual, but, but sometimes cynical. And he said, Derek, he said, when people apply for a job, generally they're applying for the money, not for the work. So when you get people and you put them into jobs that one, they can do, in an environment they're comfortable, doing work that they want to, well, then you've a chance at least of engaging them. But you know, you can take those perfectly fitted people, those people who absolutely fit their jobs perfectly, and you can still manage to disengage them if they get the wrong leadership. And that's what's too frequently forgotten. Leadership, at the end of the day, is the, is the decisive factor in engaging people. There's a study done, or a, 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 a yeah, study done every year by Fortune magazine, and they look at the hundred most engaging workforce or workplaces, the hundred best places to work. And in the most recent one, they looked at the results and they came up with what I think is absolutely a perfect statement of what our responsibility as leaders is. They said that in engaging workforces or engaged workforces, the, the engagement is dependent on three relationships. One, the relationships between employee and management. Now, if you're a manager, a leader, a team lead, if you have any responsibility for getting results from other people, 
That's you. The second relationship was the relationship between employees and their jobs and the company. And again, if you carry manager on your card, that's your responsibility. So getting the right people and the right jobs and then making sure that they have an appropriate relationship with the organization. And then finally, the relationship between employees and other employees. And again, that's our responsibility. You can take the best people in the world, put them into the absolute perfect jobs, and unless we as leaders take responsibility for engaging them, responsibility for getting that, them to go that extra mile, well then nothing works. Now, at the end of 2008, as an organization, we started looking at uh, the whole process of engagement, particularly from the perspective of leaders. We started looking and saying, well, if, if leadership is so important to engagement, why first is so little written about the leader's role in engaging people? Because what we wanted to do was figure out how could we coach our clients' leaders so that they could engage their people more effectively to get the sorts of results that highly engaged organizations get. And one of the interesting things when we started looking at uh, uh, people who got extraordinary results from other people was that we saw two words came up together, or two concepts seemed to roll together. One of them was engagement, and that's where people commit to a cause or they commit to a job and they give their all to it. And when we looked at the leaders who got those results, we saw another word tended to come up. And that second word was charisma. And if you look at the classic definition of engagement as a, as a heightened emotional connection that an employee feels for their job, so that they want to do a little bit more. And then we look at the, the classic definition of charisma being a special quality of leadership that captures the popular imagination. What we realized was that in fact, charisma and engagement are really the same thing. It's just perspective. Charismatic leaders get the results that they get because they engage people. Whether you talk about business leaders or political leaders or great leaders from history, the great charismatic leaders engage people. They make them want to engage with a cause and to go that extra mile to get it. Now, if I take you back 2,000 years before Jesus Christ was born, and you can imagine there are two Greek management development uh, uh, consultants are sitting having a conversation, Sophocles and, give me another Greek name, Nikos, and having a conversation, one of them says, that guy is an extraordinary leader. How does he get those results? I said, it must be because he's a great presenter. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Uh, but that's not quite it. Well, is it because he likes people? Yeah, that, that helps, but that's not entirely it either. Uh, is it because he's a good listener? Yeah, that helps, but... And at the end of the conversation decided, no, shoot. There are just leaders in this world who have something that not all of us have. And it must be a gift from God. And so they coined the phrase, or they coined the word, charisma. Which in the ancient Greek means gift from God. And we still today think of people whom we regard as charismatics as having some set of behaviors or some set of abilities that must be born into them. They must be a gift from God that gives them that ability to influence people the way they do and get the engagement the way they used to, or the way they do. We set out to specifically see, could we find out what charismatic leaders share in common? If we could identify that, could we, for want of a better word, bottle it so that we could help our clients and their leaders to assimilate it and get similar results. Now, if I go back to this gentleman, anybody recognize this gent? Yeah? John Kennedy. Um, it's extremely hard to find um, uh, people that I would be able to talk about that will be recognizable on a global basis as having some charisma. But for an Irish guy, this guy was the first Irish-American Catholic president. So when I was growing up, 
I was born in 59. When I was growing up, in every home in Ireland, over the fireplace, there were two photos, or two pictures. On the left-hand side would be the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I'm not sure if you've seen that picture. It's the, the heart is exposed and it had barbed wire around it and a cross. It's a very, very old picture. And on the other side was John F. Kennedy. On the same level. That was the, the way he captured the popular imagination. He inspired a whole generation of Americans, and we'll touch on that now in a moment. But in a business sense, there are lots of them there as well. One of the ones I'm going to talk about this morning here is this gentleman here, Steve Jobs, founder of Apple Computers. Against all odds, he should not be in business today. You don't want to take on Microsoft and Bill Gates, because that's usually how you die. Okay? But he should not be here today. But the force of his personality, his charisma rallied the people who work for him to the extent that they get extraordinary results. This lady here, do you recognize her out of curiosity? Isn't that incredible? She is recognizable worldwide. Now, in Ireland, week after next, we have Obama visiting. I nearly said Osama. It's been, <laughs> it's been in the news so much, you know? We have Obama visiting. You know, and you, you think I'm joking, I swear to God on my mother's life, we have found Irish roots for Obama. Have you, have you seen that in the newspaper? We have traced it back and we have found a relative of Obama in Ireland. Now that's what we do. We've only three and a half million people, 55 million in the United States claim to have Irish blood, but, but that's what we do. We tend to search back and, and find the roots of these people and kind of claim them as our own. Now, Obama doesn't really look terribly Irish, you know, it, it has to be said, but we found the roots. We really tried to find her roots, because if you've seen the recent uh, list of the world's most richest people, that lady could write a check tomorrow and solve Ireland's problem, and we can't find a single relative. <laughs> but again, again, there's somebody who from an extraordinary humble background by the force of her personality has engaged not just a nation, but several nations around the world and has captured the popular imagination and been extraordinarily successful because of it. Now, when we started off to research this, we weren't interested in the sort of charisma that, oh, I don't know, Johnny Depp or Angelina Jolie has. Not that egotistical uh, celebrity type um, uh, charisma. That has no value. It's great for your ego, but for a business, it has a little value. So the first thing we started doing was we said, we, we have to redefine charisma in a business sense. But by the way, a little interesting thing for you to do. Everybody, when they start researching these days, we all hit Google. You, you want to research anything, you hit Google or Yahoo or whatever. Go into <coughs> uh, Google when you get back to your office and put the word charisma in and do a search. And then go along the tabs and look for where you get the biggest number of hits. And it'll be under uh, images. And you get about a quarter of a million hits on a lady in a bikini. And her name is Charisma Carpenter. <laughs> and she, is, uh, she plays a part in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's apparently, uh, according to my daughter, the, the sort of second-in-command vampire slayer in the, in the program. But she's also a glamour model. Now, we obviously, with all of the confusion around charisma uh, and the way people define it, and some people thinking charisma carpenter when you mention charisma, we obviously had to define it and say, hey, what do we mean about charisma when we put it in a business setting? So we defined a more, as I say, practical or commercial charisma. We said, we want to find out what a leader has when they create and maintain a work environment where people are emotionally and intellectually committed to the goals of the organization, where they build an energetic and positive attitude in others and inspire them to do their best, and perhaps the biggest measure of engagement, where they create a common sense of purpose where people are inclined to invest extra time and energy and even some of their own time in their work. So we set out to find out what do leaders who manage to do that share in common? What is it they do that get those results? Because that on one hand 
is charisma in a very practical sense. You don't care, or maybe you do. We all have an ego hiding somewhere. But as commercial people, really, our biggest interest in charisma is if it helps me achieve the numbers I need to achieve, well, then I'm, you, you've got me. If I can engage people through the force of my personality and what I do to get better results, well, then you've got me. So we took that definition, and over a, a period of a year, we used the system called our Checkpoint 360 to speak to 40,000, or speak to, I beg your pardon, 400,000 people about their 40,000 direct reports. Now, this is the biggest ever study done ever into the topic of leadership charisma. And without technology, it wouldn't have been possible. We're blessed. We have a system where we put about a quarter of a million leaders through every year. We assess their competency and so on. And what we did was we said to these 400,000 people, here's your boss, Derek. Here's a definition of leadership charisma. To what extent does he have that? Oh, five. He has buckets of it. Four. Quite a lot. Three, yeah, he's okay. Two, hardly any. And one, charismatically bypassed. The guy is a black hole for charisma. Absolutely uninspiring, most uninspiring person you ever met in your life. And at the same time as we asked them to rate them on that, we asked them also, tell us, what do you see them do day to day? And we used a model of 70 leader behaviors that we've developed over 30 years that we know from our research are the difference between the best leaders and the rest, between those who get great results and those who don't. Once we had that, we were able to say, hey, what do the people who have high charisma share in common? What are the things that they do day to day that have that effect on people of giving that, having that charismatic impact, making people want to as I say here, uh, inspiring an attitude where they want to do their very, very best. What we found was that those people who scored at the very high end of the charisma scale shared 26 very specific behaviors in common. There are 70 behaviors in our model, 26 of them, no matter where they came from in the world. And our sample was 400,000 employees rating just under 40,000 leaders from every country we do business in worldwide. And when we looked at what defined the difference between those who had a charismatic impact on people who are uh, seen as being charismatic and the others, there were 26 things that they specifically did. First, most important thing is it comes down to behavior. Charisma is not a God-given gift. Now, it comes easier to some people than it does to others. But charisma is what people say you have when they like the things you do. Think about it. In your mind, imagine the most uh, charismatic person you can think of. Think of somebody real that you know who's charismatic. And you put them in a room, and let's make it difficult. You put a bag over their head, and you tell them just to stand there and say nothing and do nothing. And you run four or five or 600 people past them. What sort of impact do they have on that audience? Zero. You take the bag off their heads, and maybe they make eye contact, and, ooh, something has happened. Maybe just in that eye contact is a little spark. Bottom line, they start to have charismatic appeal when they do things that people like, when they do things that turn people on. It comes down to behavior. If it comes down to behavior, it means any one of us can choose to be more charismatic if we wish to. Any one of us can choose to learn and develop and assimilate and use those behaviors that charismatic leaders use to engage their people. Now, <clears throat> Can we all be a John F. Kennedy? I, theoretically, yes. But you know, you look at, the, you look at those highly, the, the Steve Jobs of this world, somehow there's something there 
whether it's where they the, the way they've been raised or whether it's in their genes, I really don't know. That makes it a little bit easier for them. But I guarantee you, every single person in this room, particularly those of you who have found yourselves or found your way into leadership positions, you already have as part of your behavior some of those charismatic behaviors. It's normal for you. But you also lack some of them. Any one of us can choose to add some of those behaviors to the way we interact with our people and increase the charismatic impact, increase the engaging impact we have upon them. The important thing is we have to know what those behaviors are first. Let me just go back for a moment. Now, I said it's all about behavior. I wanted to, I, I mentioned Steve Jobs. Has anybody seen Steve Jobs speak? I, I don't even mean in person, I mean on the, okay, you've seen him. He's a pretty um, uh, dynamic sort of individual. Here's a piece of video which uh, was before Apple computers took off to any great extent. Okay, before, it, before he became who he is. And it's one of the first interviews that he ever had. And what I want you to focus upon, the, the sound from this is not going to be great, it's pretty low. What I want you to focus upon with this young man is how charismatic is he at this particular point in time? This is before it all started to happen mm -hmm. when, when Apple Computer had just been founded. Now let me turn that machine around and you, you have some chance of hearing the sound because the sound of this particular clip is, is not fantastic. So let's try that. So just, just look and you see, does this fit with the, the view that you have of Stephen Jobs as, you, uh, as he is today? And if anybody wants to see the whole thing, you could see it in the break. Here's my point. See that guy? Now, you put yourself into his seat and maybe it's your first time on television. You can see he is nervous. I mean, first off, he doesn't even know that he's chewing away on the gum. You know, and every so often he's doing this with his hair. Like it's, it, the body language is electric. He is just so nervous that he's, oh, they're watching me in New York. Oh my God. Here's my point. That guy who was absolutely, had the intellect obviously at that stage, he was as far from what we think of Steve Jobs today as you could get. Here's Steve Jobs today. What he did in the intervening 25 years was he learned how to be Steve Jobs. He learned how to harness those behaviors that specifically had that impact of creating what people around them call the reality distortion field. Have you heard them use that expression about Jobs? They say that when you're around uh, Jobs, that he has a way of getting people so excited and so engaged and so into what they're doing that it's like reality distorts. And they talk about the Jobs reality distortion field. Difference between that guy and the guy 25 years ago are the behaviors that he has learned to assimilate to help him engage people to get the results that Apple get. And you've probably noticed that for the first time in the last couple of weeks, I think, didn't Apple go more profitable than uh, uh, Microsoft in the last couple of weeks? So a long, long, hard battle and a huge amount of it, and it's evidenced by what happened when he was out of the organization, comes down to the force of Job's personality. Here's the point. Charismatic impact, the ability to engage on the part of a leader can be learned. It's about behavior and any of us who choose to learn it can learn it. Any of us who want to can become more engaging. In the book, we took the research which focuses mainly on the, the fourth part of this uh, uh, four step approach to becoming uh, a more engaging, more charismatic leader. And we decided that there's no point giving people research. Nobody cares. You don't care about the numbers. I, I lay them out and I say, hey, and 75% of the leaders who are, had a charismatic impact had 7.7 .7 coefficient of, yeah, yeah. Who gives them? What do you care is, hey, Derek, tell me what they don't tell me at the end of the Harvard Business Review. Tell me what to do next. Give me step one. Give me step two. Give me step three. So when we put the information together, we put it together in a four-step plan that said, if you are a leader who's responsible for getting results, if you want to engage your people more, here is the way to do it. And that's what I want to step you through uh, this morning. This, this sounds like such an obvious one, but you know, if this is about behavior, 
Well, then it means that you have to actually put the behavior in place to make it work. Now, if you're not already getting the results that a charismatic leader gets, well, then it's because you're not using the behaviors that charismatic leaders use. So uh, the first thing that you have to do is you have to make the decision that I'm going to do what it takes. Now, I say that because the reality is if you had wanted to do this or had been motivated to do this in the past, you would already be using those behaviors. You would already be behaving that way. If you're not, it's because you're doing what works for you, what's comfortable for you, what's natural for you. Changing is tough and changing starts with a decision. Covey's uh, book there, The Eighth Habit, I found it terribly difficult to read. And, I, and, and English is my first language, you know, and it's just hard, hard, heavy going. But he had one or two really, really great nuggets in there. And this was one of them. He said, inspirational leaders choose to be inspirational leaders. They make the choices that enable them to be inspirational leaders. Well, if you want to be a charismatic leader, if you want to get the results the charismatic leaders get, it starts with a decision that says, okay, I know there's going to be work involved, but I'm going to do it. But I'm actually going to commit to it. And that's, the, that's, that's as simple as that step is. Second one I think is, is terribly important. I'm going to talk to you this morning about two sides of charisma. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the two things uh, that are absolutely at the core of those leaders who have an engaging impact upon people. The first one comes from inside them. The first critical foundation for a person to be capable of being a charismatic leader is they must actually feel confident that they can be. Self-confidence is tremendously important. You will never ever meet a leader who has an engaging impact upon people who is not extremely self-assured, extremely confident, and extremely together. Now, all that is, is a function of just in their own minds having clear, compelling goals. One third or one quarter of this book is just devoted to uh, create, making sure that you have at a personal level, at a family level, at a business level, clear, compelling goals that tell you why you're doing what you're doing at any point in time, where it is you're trying to get, what you're going to do today that's going to move you towards those goals. Because without that clarity, without that confidence, you'll see that nothing else that I talk about this morning is actually possible. If you don't feel confident about yourself, you will not inspire trust, confidence, excitement, enthusiasm, or engagement in other people. And so a large part of this starts with your dedication to ensuring that you are clear about where you're going and that you're clear uh, that the things that you are doing right now are contributing to where you want to go ultimately. So the, the second step, and I'm not going to spend time on it this morning because I could, see, I could see a number of people there and they were going, oh my God, he's going to do a goal development workshop. Oh, help me. Get me out of here. No, I'm not. There are dozens of programs you can do. And in fact, if anybody here doesn't have for themselves, I'm not asking for a show of hands, if anybody here doesn't have for themselves a clear, compelling set of goals, make sure you let me have your, your email address before the end of the uh, session. Because I'll send you uh, a document, a book developed by a friend of mine in Australia. And he, he wrote this book. And he made it a goal that he was going to give away, free of charge, one million copies of it. And it's a step-by-step -step process for putting together a, a set of personal and professional goals. Really well done. Sort of thing you'd expect to spend a lot of money on. And he didn't do it because he's just a really nice guy. He is a nice guy. He did it because he has his name and he has his telephone number on the back of a million copies of it floating around the world. And it hasn't done him any harm whatsoever. But if you don't have clear, compelling goals, if you don't have a confident self-talk, if you are not absolutely positive and focused, you cannot be a charismatic leader. You cannot inspire others to engage and to trust. Those are two critical first steps. Next one is charisma, or is the, the physical side of things. And I, 
I mentioned already that a large part of charisma is trust. You want people to engage with you. You have to win their trust first. Before anything else, they have to trust you. Nobody is going to give you their time, their energy, their commitment. Nobody's going to believe what you are, commit to the goals that you have for them, unless they trust you. And a huge amount of that trust comes down to things that have nothing to do with the words that you've said or that you say. Now, when I stepped up on this stage this morning, in about 200 milliseconds, you decided whether you liked me or not, whether I was a friendly person or whether I was a threat, whether I was an enemy, whether I was going to give you something or I was going to take something from you. And it all happened, you know, zoom, zoom. 50th of a second. It all just, you made those decisions without any real conscious thought. You made that decision. You made that determination. And that, and that shaped a certain amount of the way you're reacting to me now. Now, that decision was made in a small part of your brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is a small almond-shaped uh, uh, part of the brain, right on the brain stem, right in the core of the oldest part of the brain. They tell us that it's probably about 500 million years old. And that was the first brain that we all, when we evolved into reptiles, used to survive. And it basically has the same functions as a reptile brain has today. The, the, the scientists refer to it as the reptile brain. And all it's about is keeping you alive. A reptile doesn't think, oh, look at that eagle over there. He looks rather big. Um, I wonder, is he going to eat? Now, let me think. Is he carnivorous or no, omnivorous or whatever? No, he sees something, <clears throat> and by the size of it, by the shape of it, by the way it moves, instantly it makes a decision. Am I going to fight, you've heard it, or am I going to flee? Am I going to fight or flight? Am I going to fight this thing or am I going to run away? Most basic of survival instincts. And deep inside all of our brains, we react in that way to every single person we meet every day, every second of the day, way, way down below the more complicated parts of the brains we make those decisions. Now, when you looked at me walking up here, you looked at my body, you looked at what way I was presenting my body, you looked at what shape I was making, what was going on in my face, and all of that happened instantly. And you either decided, as I say, did you like me or you didn't like me. And then on an ongoing basis, you, you, re, you, you redefine that decision again and again and again. And you decide whether you're going to trust me or not. Now, as I stand up here, <clears throat> I consciously try to use body language that will appease your reptilian brain, will make you feel comfortable. Okay? and make you feel that I am somebody to be trusted. Because long before I speak anything to you that you like or dislike, you will make that determination. Every single thing you do, every single move you make is important. Let me give you a for example. Um, uh, I'm going to show you how to shake hands. Okay? Now, very basic, body language. Could, could I use you as a, a, would you mind? Now, first thing I'm going to teach you let me kill this for a moment, if I may. First thing I'm going to teach you is I'm going to show you how to shake hands in a way that somebody will absolutely mistrust you, will not like you, and will have a negative impression of you straight off. Okay? So watch this gentleman's reaction as I shake hands with him. Hi there. How are you? It's very nice to meet you. How's it going? <laughs> now, shut it. He knew, he knew I was going to, to do something. That was going to, but, but even though he knew that, after a couple of seconds, he went, Ugh, uh, and he got that sort of yuck. Now, all I did was, I just gave him, if I can do it in slow motion, I just gave him the tops of my fingers. I didn't let him feel the palm of my hand. And he reacted, Ugh. And, and in fact, if you stand there like that, you, you'll start to see in a few moments that he'll actually start to shift from foot to foot. Because what I refused to do there, I refused to let him see the palm of my hand or feel the palm of my hand. Let's make him feel comfortable for now. When I let him feel the palm of my hand, that goes all the way back to, stay there, all the way back to those pre-verbal days when he had no words to speak, and the first impression, I walk over and he goes, friend or enemy? Yeah, he doesn't look like much of an enemy. I wonder if he's carrying a weapon. And what he wanted to do in feeling my palm there was he wanted to be sure, oh, okay, there's no weapon there. It's safe. 
I, 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 I'm not hiding anything from him. I'm, I'm giving him all the information about myself, and now he feels comfortable. And so the relationship moves on another little bit. Now, um, one of the things you'll notice as well, by the way, uh, is uh, when you get people who are uh, really, really good at making fe people feel comfortably, they unconsciously will tend to turn the hand of the other person over. Now, that's a little bit exaggerated, but they, they tend to give the other person the upper hand. Because again, when I give him, when I let his hand go on the top of my hand, he has more control over my arm than I have over his arm. And by the way, if I want to make him really, really feel really comfortable, I bring that into my <laughs> belly area. Okay? So I step up to him and I shake hands, and I let him have the upper hand, and I pull his hand in that direction. Now, the reason that he'll start to feel comfortable there is because in, in uh, uh, prehistory, if you wanted to kill them, well, if you want to kill them now, what you do is you attack their most vulnerable part. If I bring his hand in there to my most vulnerable part, he knows that he is, uh, that I am not out to hurt them. I am exposed to him. He is absolutely in control of that situation. Now, you watch anybody, in fact, I'll get you to do it in a moment, anybody when you shake hands and you give them that, everybody has the same, re <laughs> and we call it the wet fish. Here's the worst handshake in the world. Okay? You want to, first, don't give them your fingers. Second, turn your hand on top of theirs. And third, push it into their belly area. I guarantee you, turns them off immediately. Now, something as simple as shaking hands can have that dramatic an impact upon things. Imagine what everything else, thank you very much. Uh, imagine what everything else that you do has. Every move you make, every time you stand in front of people, every gesture is being parsed by that sort of the mind, or by that part of the mind. And we're making decisions about it. If you want to engage people, if you want people to feel just automatically comfortable with you, you have to make all of those things work. You have to particularly avoid making the mistake of those sort of uh, limp-wristed uh, handshakes and, and so on. Now, just, just by way of uh, getting some air into the room, let me, let me get you, I'm gonna get you on your feet for a moment. And what I want you to do is turn to the person beside you and do two things for me, a couple of them. First, do the little limp handshake so that you get the feel of that. Just give the other person the tops and just see what it feels like. And then give it the handshake where you let their hand come over the top of yours. So do, just please stand up and, and just with the person beside you, first give them the limp handshake. Each of you try it and then use the regular one. Hi there, very nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, I did it. Hi, how are you? Yeah. It's a horrible feeling, isn't it? It's a cold fish. Yeah. Where is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and you, get, you get some people will do this, and they specifically want it. They've read the books, and they're specifically trying to, trying to make you feel uncomfortable. Okay, folks, thank you very much. And of course, you get people who have read, you get people who have read the book, yeah. And they're, 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 you know the people who mangle your hand, and they, uh, they, they give you the bone crusher handshake. And not only do that, you'll get people who turn the hand over and push it away there, specifically because they're trying to be the big dog, you know, and they're trying to make themselves a big fella. Here's, here's what we're about. We're about trying to get people to trust us. That means that we have to learn what is it that turns people off from us. Every single thing you ever do, Every single move you ever make has an impact upon people. Remember I mentioned the belly area, okay? You expose your belly, it means automatically the subconscious message that you send to people is that you're, you're not afraid, you're trustworthy, you're not hiding anything. So uh, let's look at some of the, the, the language, uh, the body language that, that is typical of charismatic people. Now, I just, if you look around at people around the room there when I put that up, the most natural thing in the world, as soon as this guy went up there as my little nephew, what happens is you see that smile and, and everybody involuntarily smiles. It, it's programmed into you. It's mimicry that has been programmed into you. In fact, I used to try that <clears throat> with a, a picture of him full scale. Now, an infant full scale, he actually looks demonic. It's, it's absolutely dreadful, which is why I made it small. Now, what, <clears throat> what happens when somebody like that, when, when you get a smile and someone smiles at you, 
First thing is we are programmed to mimic other people's uh, body language. So when you smile at somebody, they can't help but smiling back. Some of them will damp it down and so on and so forth. And when they smile at you, an interesting thing happens, something that we're going to talk about a little bit later on as well. They get a chemical reaction in their brain. They get serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin injected into their brains. Bottom line, they feel better. And when they feel better, they smile a little bit more. And when they smile a little bit more, and what happens if you are the person who is the boss or the leader, and you make a choice that instead of being this very proper, serious sort of person, because you know when you're a leader, you're supposed to be serious, you're not supposed to smile at all, because it's very, these are serious times, absolutely, and, and to smile about it would be wrong. And you make that decision to smile. That smile goes around the room in a heartbeat. It changes the chemical makeup of people's brains, and it sets off a chain reaction. You smile, they smile, chemical in the brain, feeling a little better, they smile, they smile back at you, yada, 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 yada. Tiny, tiny things, they make a big, big difference. If you're ever presenting to people and you walk onto the stage, even though you don't feel like it, I do this a lot. I talk to people a lot and I am always nervous before I go up there. And the last thing in the world I want to be doing is smiling. But you smile and immediately you see the, the people in the audience go, oh, thank God, he feels comfortable. Because as soon as he feels comfortable, you start to feel a bit comfortable. If you're the boss and you've got no smile, that lack of warmth will go around the office in a heartbeat. Let me give you a vocabulary of seven positive gestures. Use these when you're trying to convince, use them when you're trying to persuade, use them when you're making presentations. These are uh, vocabulary that you can string together that will help you to, um, uh, to come across as being much more positive. Now, first thing, this is classic. I said to you earlier on, you know, the reason that you shake hands with people is so that they see uh, that you don't have a weapon. You want people to trust you. Hey, look, I'm absolutely telling you the truth. Open hands, expose the solar plexus. Always, always, always expose the solar plexus. If you're hiding a solar plexus, you're doing this. People subconsciously see that as being holding back, as holding back information, as hiding something. Okay, so you want to get a across the message of nothing to hide. Hey, listen, would I lie to you? Now, you see politicians do that all the time. Hey, would I lie to you? Damn right they would. <laughs> see, there are, there are people in this world <clears throat> who are really genuinely professional liars. Think about it. Actors are professional liars. What they do is inside their minds, they imagine a time when they're feeling the emotion that, they, were, that they, they want to feel right now, and then on the outside they can make the body language work and make it look honest. And it's the same with politicians, it's the same with lawyers who have to go in sometimes and defend people whom they know are absolutely guilty, and they have to perform as if they, are, uh, they absolutely believe it and they're absolutely open. You want somebody to believe you, give them just open hands, open body language. I mean this sincerely, and this, it couldn't be easier. I, I, I want to tell you honestly, I would not tell you a lie. Here's, I, I, from the heart, I wouldn't let you down. And from the heart, it has an extraordinary impact upon people. Hands up like that are positive and open. Hands down like that are authoritative, they're controlling, and they're threatening to people. Okay? And that's the worst of it. God, don't you hate that when somebody says, and what I want you to do after this, and you just, you don't care who it is, you want to break that off and stick it in their ear. You don't, it's just the most awful thing. And yet, sometimes you have a point to make, and you have to do that, and you want to do that. When you want to do that, you can do it by doing that. Watch the politicians, watch the really skilled guys. When they want to do that, they get the same impact by doing that. And here's another thing I want you to know, and it's not offensive, it's not like a weapon, it's not like a baton, but it still has the same impact. So I can lecture you and say, and one of the most important points is, and you won't take offense the way you will with that. So watch them, and watch when you're watching, watch your politicians when they're speaking. The really good orators use that all the time. I'm in control. I went to a, a presentation class about 20 years ago, and they killed me for some of my habits. And one, of them they one that they killed me for was they called it the basketball. 
They said, Derek, all the time you're talking, you're doing this. It's like you have a freaking basketball in your hand and you're doing this all the time. And I tried for years to learn to present like that. <laughs> and you know, and you're, you're kind of, and you find you're, uh, and you're trying to force it back. And I found out years later reading, in fact, that all of the research says that that is actually what tells people that you've got, when you say to somebody, I've got this entirely under control, that basketball language tells them that you feel in control. You watch your own language when you're speaking. When you genuinely feel things are under control, for some reason, your hands go back to here. Be aware of them. So don't say, I'm under control. I've got this entirely under control. Or listen, I mean this entirely from my heart. I'm being completely honest with you. The important thing is that you, your language, your body language is aligned with what you're saying. Because if you say, I'm being completely honest with you, I wouldn't tell you a lie. People don't believe the words. They don't even know why. They believe the gestures. They believe the language, the body language. This is well thought out. This is super. You see them again, watch this. Watch over the next few nights when you see the TV. When people say, when the they really good presenters want to make a point, they say, and the first point I want to make is, and the second point I want to make is, and the third point, and some people use the little finger, first point I want to make, second point I want to make. Enormously powerful, extraordinary, particularly when you're presenting to people, even one-on-one -on -one with people. You know, the first thing we've got to do is, is this. And the second thing we've got to do is this. That gives the impression that you are really under control. And that's a classic. No, finished. Karate chop. That's that. You want somebody to know the conversation's over, you just have to do that. They know. Even if they continue to talk, they know you say, no, I've made my decision. And it can be that or it can be that. That's that. And then I'm confident of my position. Oh, sorry, gone blank on that one. Okay, ones to be aware of. When you're trying to persuade people, keep your hands away from your face. You ever see that? I did not have sex with that woman. It's not believable. I did not have sex with that woman. That's believable. Uh, by the way, I did not have sex with that woman. It was Bill Clinton from a couple of years ago, just in case you think it's something to do with my personal life. Uh, if you're trying to make a point to somebody and you're trying to persuade them, you're trying to persuade them and you're telling the truth, keep your hands away from your mouth, keep your hands away from your nose, keep your hands as far away from your face as you can get them. We subconsciously read that as, defection, as uh, uh, deception. Hands over the mouth. Uh, did you ever see a child telling lies? Uh, yeah, it wasn't me that broke it. Uh, it was somebody else. And what they're doing is they're subconsciously trying to hide the words that they know are telling lies. Here's a teenager telling a lie. No, I, I was in the 12 last night. Okay. And, here's, and here's an adult who has perfected a little bit better. Uh, no, no, that's absolutely true. Yeah, no, the, I, I, I can tell you for certain that uh, I wouldn't lie to you. Uh, you watch for that language in other people, and it's, it's amazing. There is no 100% foolproof way of knowing someone's lying. But there is a 100% foolproof way of planting a suspicion in somebody's mind. And that is to do any of that while you're saying, I'm telling you the truth. This is all I have to say. So hands near your face, no, 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 keep them away when you're trying to persuade. Arms crossed. I personally, I stand like that and I'm comfortable. In the United States, they think that's closed body language. They think that I'm trying to hide myself. And the key thing with this is, one, it's kind of hiding your solar plexus, so it can be misunderstood. The easiest thing is, don't fold your arms if you're trying to give an open impression to people, if you're trying to communicate with them openly, just don't close your arms. That way it won't be misinterpreted. Some people in, in misinterpret that as, uh, uh, as being defensive, as being closed off, and so on. Classic one, you know, like the footballers. And you know, it's funny, I, I'm not sure if you've seen this, the, the, the penalty kick. You see the penalty kick on the business stage all the time. Guy is waiting to make his presentation, he's standing there like that. Subconsciously, he's afraid, oh, what are they going to do to me? It's, it's the, it's, you see it all the time. And people are and they're standing there and they're looking confident. They got a wonderful suit on and they got themselves covered. And you know, boy, is he nervous or boy, is she nervous. For God's sakes, keep your hands away from your genital area. You know, it just, it just looks defensive and it feels so comfortable. 
You know why it feels comfortable? Because it's safe. Because even if he kicks that ball at me 200 miles an hour, the worst he'll do is break my wrist. Okay, so keep your hands away from there. Uh, by the way, a safe position is always, even though it doesn't feel like it, it's just hands by the side, is better than your hands almost anywhere else. Here's another classic one. I hate podiums. Podia, podiums. I hate talking behind a podium because you have to work harder to get people to believe you. You have to work harder to get your point across because they're, they're missing the information there. And in fact, the podium is up here, isn't it? So you've got that sort of defensive shield that they're putting up where they're, they're keeping you at arm's length. It unconsciously switches off people's trust. Now, if you want to engage people, you want people to say, hey, this guy is trustworthy. This guy is really genuinely acting in my interests. Well, then what you have to do is become aware of your body language and become aware. I'm not talking about become a fake it um, sort of robotic sort of character. Just become aware of, uh, for example, when you're talking to people, don't, don't be giving it that, you know? Uh, by the way, this gentleman over here has his, his hand like, no, you're okay, you're okay. That, that, when you're sitting there and you're listening to somebody, that, that's in general, that's attention. You know, so it's, a lot of it is context as well. You know, if I'm saying to you, hey, yeah, absolutely, I'll be there at half seven. I know damn well I won't be there at half seven. If I'm sitting there listening like that, I'm listening to you. Oh, we'll come back to listening. Clenched fists. Clenched fists is obvious. You know, when you, when you get angry, you can't help it. You do that. Now, we are very controlled in business. And you're in a negotiation with somebody and you really don't like what he's saying, but you're smiling through your clenched teeth anyway. You need to watch that. Because even though you don't even necessarily notice it, and they don't even consciously notice it, you got clenched fists saying, yeah, okay, I'll give you an extra 10%, be delighted to. And you're really thinking, I could smack your head in just as quick as look at you. It's seen, it's noticed. So just, just the key thing is be aware of it. Be aware that you keep your language or you keep your body language as open as possible. If your hands are away from your body, that is about the most positive gesture that you can make to people. So when it comes to, and, and that's a very quick touch on it, when it comes to um, uh, body language, there are several things that are really important. And in fact, I'm, I'm ending with what should have been the first one, posture. Jeez, I, have, I, I think we all do because of the amount of time we spend in front of machines and in front of television. But a lot of us tend towards that. I, I find from sitting in front of the machine, I'm getting round-shouldered. You watch, sometimes we do a demonstration. You watch somebody walk into a room, they walk in like that, versus somebody who walks in like that. Somebody with an upright posture looks more youthful, they look more vigorous, they look more enthusiastic. Somebody slumped over looks like they're tired, they're beaten down. In all of the research, they, when people observe people with a slumped posture, whether it's physically, uh, 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 whether it's um, uh, something is involuntary or not, uh, they observe them to be beaten, losers, negative, and so on. So be aware of your posture. The smile is the cheapest thing you can ever do. It's the least expensive way of injecting some warmth into a, into a situation. I love, honestly, I love in airports, the majority of people in airports hate their jobs, in my experience. People behind the counters, you know, they meet so many obnoxious people day to day that I think even some of the nicest people get worn down. And you walk up to them with a big smile on your face, and I guarantee you the coldest of them cannot help but warm slightly, and you can see them trying to resist, and you just keep talking to them with your smile on your face and saying, it's a wonderful day, isn't it great? And even though they won't say, you know, you've made me feel really better today, you made a difference to them. But you made a difference to yourself. But in the workplace with the people you're working with, even if it's not your style, crack a smile a little. Hey, I need to remember that. Even if it's not your style, crack a smile. The nonverbal body language is important and the gestures are important. Now, obviously, there's an awful lot more about that in the, in the book and more than we can go into in this uh, uh, brief session. A little piece on, on touch. Again, back to the reptilian brain. First, we observe and we see, is he big? Is he bigger than me? Is he looking threatening? What sort of gestures is he making? What's he doing on his face? And then if I like and I feel safe enough, I move in and I want to touch him. I want to shake hands. One of the most impactful things you can do is touch somebody. Now, it has to be appropriate. 
obviously. Uh, uh, you have to decide, and I don't know what's appropriate in Slovenia, but, but you know, even in a, in a tense situation with colleagues, people that I know better, even tapping them on the back of the hand and saying, ah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Even that can make an extraordinary difference in the, the warmth of a relationship. Um, so even a, a touch on the elbow, a touch on the shoulder, you just need to get it right. But all of that, all of this stuff, which has nothing to do with what you read in the management uh, and leadership books, has an extraordinary impact. Final statistic on this, 55% of the information that you collect from people, you collect pre-verbally, before they even say a word. You collect it from the way they look and the way they sound. So what I'm going to do is we break there for, say, 10 minutes. Is that okay? okay. And uh, get some coffee, stretch your legs, do a little bit of handshaking, and then we'll take it up from there. <laughs>